Um, thank you for coming uh, to my talk. Some in the Leeds area might have seen this one already. Um, but this is the tale of Phineas Fisher. Um, just a quick show of hands. Who's heard of Phineas Fisher before? Uh, n not as many as I, as I thought would be, but cool. Okay, so let's jump right in. So, my name is Jake. Uh, I'm a full-time blue teamer, a hobbyist, security guy, a security researcher, sorry. Um, I do some privacy stuff at uh, Org, uh, Org Leads, if you're interested. And when I'm not doing security stuff, I take mediocre photography, uh, like that one there. <laughs> That's what I do in my spare time when I'm not doing the cybers. Um, so, let's have a look at the timeline of Phineas Fisher then, because a lot of people know of the hacks, but maybe don't know how many they w there are and the, the time that is in between them and the different ones. So this is what we're going to go through today. These are the hacks that we're going to talk through uh, and address one by one. So let's go into Gamma Labs then. So, or Gamma Industries as a, as a company, uh, the company's name. So as Phineas says, hacking is a tool. The problem though is that companies like Gamma Labs sell to customers who seek to use hacking to evil ends. Brief history on um, Gamma, for those that maybe not heard of them before. Uh, they sell spyware. So they, spell, they, they sell uh, sophisticated tools to uh, governments around the world and uh, law enforcement <coughs> departments. And uh, I, I don't know if you can see it, but there's a very well, but there's a map that shows their sort of uh, prolification throughout the world. And there's different um, colour codes. So maybe you can see some of the countries where they operate and make your assumptions about whether that technology is used uh, ethically um, or not. So how did Phineas hack Gamma Labs? Well, it all started with a support site, which uh, they discovered. Uh, finsupport.finfisher.com um, And what they noticed is that the website had, uh, the developer of that website had made many, many others and they noticed that there were some SQL injection and LFI vulnerabilities that allowed them to basically get that, get the source code of that site and uh, look through it. So Having having looked at this using LFI and, and you know uh, not standard sort of web application uh, testing stuff, Phineas noticed that the web server was up to date, so there was no uh, there was no chance of privilege escalation, right? Because it was fully patched. There was no at the time there were no vulnerabilities for the web server. Um, so I, I you know what, what do they do, right? What would you do in that situation? If you're a red teamer, you probably see this stuff all the time. But me as a blue teamer, you sort of ask those questions. Um, but they noticed there's a, there's a, there's a file uh, on that web server called Q18. And inside that, f that file, that directory, contained a copy of the mobile uh, malware product, or that mobile product called FinSpy. And that's where that came from. So if you ever heard about the leaking of a FinSpy, this is where it came from. However, uh, you know, there wasn't really um, a lot there for Phineas. Uh, they set up a, f a fake Gamma Group PR Twitter account, which I thought was quite funny. Um, and they take, a, they, take a, they take a copy of the data that they found on the QA service, that directory. They do also get access from the support website to some of the products, but they're encrypted and they're still encrypted to this day. So samples of those uh, binaries are not out in the wild uh, in a decrypted format. Um, and there was also copies of customer uh, help desk esque you know, tickets. Um, and this revealed some of the customers that dealt with Gamma Labs. So as you can see, there is a list. Um, but, you know, you've got what you'd expect, law enforcement, uh, things like that. Um, <clears throat> so, yeah, so let's so that's Gamma Labs. So there wasn't, there wasn't really too much fallout, right? They got owned. It was embarrassing for the company, but there wasn't that juicy sort of data that Phineas wanted. So let's move on to the next target which is Hacking Team. Um, and hopefully this video will demonstrate uh, and explain to you what they do. You have no challenges today. Sensitive data is transmitted over encrypted channels. Often the information you want is not transmitted at all. 
Your target may be outside your monitoring domain. Is passive monitoring enough? You need more. You want to look through your target's eyes. You have to hack your target. You have to hit many different platforms. You have to overcome encryption and capture relevant data. So that's hacking team. I don't think I could have summed them up better myself, to be honest, right? They're very brazen about what they do. They don't hide it, hide themselves behind shell companies or, you know, they're very sort of honest uh, in the capabilities, capabilities they provide to their clients. Um, so here's another quote from Finish's manifesto. Hacking team had very little exposed to the internet. For example, like Gamma Group, the customer support site needed a client certificate to connect. They had their main website, it was running Joomla, a mail server, a couple of routers, and two VPN appliances. So not not that not that much of a of a big estate there. Uh, again, a little bit of, of a backstory on a uh, hacking team. So uh, again, coloured uh, coloured map some stories there. If you want to go look at those, you can. Um, but I'm not going to go into them with too much detail. But you, again, you can see they're spread across the world, the countries that they operated in, and where they provide services. So again. You've, you can get an example of the type of clientele that, excuse me, that hacking team uh, did business with. Okay, so let's move on to the hack itself. So that right there is hacking team's IP range, as you can see. And this is what Phineas began with. So they began with an IP range, um, and then from there, looked at their estate, right? And that's where you, you saw the summary of the appliances and things that were exposed. So let's have a quick quiz, shall we? Phineas mentions in the manifesto they had three options. So how do we think today, how did Phineas uh, break in to hacking team? So I want you to just put your hand up for each one. So who thinks it was a zero day in Joomla? Oh. Who thinks it's a zero day in Postfix? No takers. Okay, I'm expecting some hands up. Who thinks it was a zero day in an embedded device? <laughs> well done, yeah. So... We now know what this was, and we'll cover this later in the talk, but this was a smooth wall VPN appliance. So Phineas had found an ICE inside this sonic wall appliance uh, and used that to break in. Okay. So this begins the sort of the listening phase. So now that they had compromised and they were on the network, we started using Nmap to scan out different parts of the environment, right? Again, standard sort of attacker stuff. Um, they discover some MongoDB servers that were open on the, on the LAN. Um, and inside there were some audio files, um, which were sort of debugging, but it was the, the QA teams testing their, uh, the uh, malware, so the different systems there, the Galileo and DaVinci platforms. Uh, and they, they were just testing, you know, making sure the, the microphone was captured, when the device was compromised, those sorts of things. And you can listen to those as well, they're online uh, in dumps. Uh, you can listen to them. There's nothing really, you know, sensitive, but it's just them testing to make sure they can capture those conversations. Um, so... I don't know if it's blurry, but as you can see, so as they're moving around, they discover there's a, there's a backup server. And according to the official documentation that we now have, because Phineas stole it, you can see that they, they say that the backup servers are on a different subnet. However, Phineas sees this is not, not the case. They are, they are actually uh, are accessible. Um, and with that, they're able to find a backup of the old an old exchange server. And they're able to mine inside of there um, for credentials. So, what do you think the passwords look like for the accounts that were compromised? 
So, do we think it was industry recommended? <laughs> <laughs> do we think it was a variation of password? <laughs> Come on, let's give him some credit. Do you think it was reasonably complex? It wasn't industry recommended, it wasn't a variation of password, but it was kind of complex. Okay. There's his password. <laughs> yeah, so domain admin on their uh, on their estate had that as their password. Um, and Phineas even comments as well, Grace says, I mean, right, that's a direct quote from Phineas. <coughs> okay, so this this one's quite a so this is you know so think about this right from like a, a kill chain perspective, so from backups to domain admin is literally what happened here right because of the of the, the password that was found, um, and you can see a dump of the other passwords as well that were discovered, so it looks like there were people that weren't maysbe at that level uh, see uh, admin level but had better and more complex passwords it was quite interesting. Um, here's a screenshot of the file servers that were captured by Phineas, so you can see full. Property, uh, traversal of those different elements. And again, you can browse this online. You can go through this if you want. So next then, so once you had a domain admin account, you wanted to hunt down the sysadmins. So those two people there are the current sysadmins at Hacking Team. They're still employed. Um, the reason why I'm showing them as their faces is because they're, they're, it's public information. They've spoke on record about Hacking Team and the breach. It's not as if, you know, they're not used to the limelight. Um, but they're still working at Hacking Team. And uh, the gentleman on the left is the uh, yeah, is the guy that was had had that weak password. Um, and uh, if you go through the breach, if you go through the, the, the files that Finney's stolen, a lot of them pertain to this individual uh, because he had lots of unsavory content on his work machine. Um, I'll let you imagine what that was. Uh, yes, he watched it at work um, and was caught by Finney's with screen grabs and things like that. So pretty, I wouldn't want to be in that position. <laughs> um, okay, so pretty much that... that breaks it up in a nutshell. I mean, that, that pretty much is it, is it. So after Phineas has his demand account, they scan the network again and they find a NADJOS asset management device. And if you picture their network, I don't have a picture of this, but the topology basically went as follows. So you had like a corporate network and then you had a development network. And there was a device in the middle that bridged them and that was it. So once Phineas compromised or logged in, let's say, to that NADJOS uh, device, they were then able to go over to the development network and that's when they were able to get all that juicy information. So, you know... Um, all the development stuff around RCS and um, the implants. So I think it was David this morning's keynote mentioned, sorry, in his opening talk, I mentioned uh, the differences between Hacking Team and NSO. The reason why we know those differences is because of Phineas, because they broke in and, re and leaked that information. Uh, yes, that's a cu custom gift I made. I'm not proud of it, but uh, <laughs> I think it, it, it glammed it up a little bit. Um, okay, so that was Hacking Team. So we're two breaches in. Let's move on. So the third breach in the uh, in the history of uh, Phineas was SME, a Spanish uh, police union or a police division. Um, so this one is quite special. So this one, Phineas actually recorded the entire breach. They didn't record the uh, reconnaissance phase, but they, they did record themselves actually doing it. Um, and again, uh, you can find the full clip of that uh, online. But uh, here's a here's a snippet. So. Basically, um, as you can sort of see, there's an SQL map there, as you would expect. So there's, there's a website that Phineas did some recon on, uh, discovered that it was SQLi um, vulnerable, uh, injected into it, uh, dumped the WP config database, uh, and used that and, you know, to leverage themselves and give them more access. They backdoored the login pages as well, to, so they could get a copy of the password, so they could use those in different things. And uh, as you can see, the, the information that was actually um, leaked because of this, it's quite, the officer's names, you know, personal information. It's, you know, it's, it's, it's a pretty big hit for the, for the, the organization to have that stuff out there on the internet. Um, and so what you can also uh, see as well is so that after they backed the login page, they discovered that uh, from this, in this database, they discovered that the, they reused the uh, password for the Twitter account. So if anything takes this over and begins their own sort of PR campaign uh, for the, for the union, um, which looked like this. So what they did is they replaced the header image with images of the victims of this particular police union. And as you can see, uh, it's of people being uh, beaten up and, um, you know, perhaps atrocities being committed or being documented. And obviously it's fair to say that the police union were not happy about that. So uh, again, another perhaps 
uh, maybe the start of a politically motivated uh, campaign by Finish there. Um, clearly, it had some sort of uh, ulterior motive other than um, privacy or, you know, um, protecting someone's rights or things like that. Mm. Okay, cool. So let's move on then to the next hack, which <clears throat> was the Cayman National Bank. Yes, Finis broke into a bank. So, uh, as you can see there, so they broke into a bank and stole 10,000 euro. They stole more than that, and we'll get into that, but that's Finis' comment on that. And here's the Bitcoin transaction. So, of course, you can see those things. So, Finis uh, gives 10,000 euros to the people of Rojava, um, and you can see that transaction there. Before, um, before that activity, though, there was a... There's a, a Reddit account that was attributed to Phineas, and they commented on a number of posts. One in particular was this one, um, in which it says, uh, it translates as, uh, the banks steal from you, so why don't you steal from banks? And Phineas commented on this, uh, you know, words to the effect of, the, you know, people already do this, and made references to some of the uh, criminal gangs in Europe that had already been looking at breaking into banks or had successfully broken into banks, um, saying that it is possible. So maybe this was a foreshadow that they had already done this or were going to do this. Okay, so I think it's important to sort of highlight the Rojava and why that's important maybe to Phineas. So let's do that. So here's a map of uh, Syria um, and you can see the surrounding countries and I think we're all pretty aware of the situation in Syria what's been going on for the last couple of years. The Rojava is that a yellow um, sort of marking there um, particularly to the north or northeast of, of that sort of quadrant. Um, and uh, <clears throat> so in February, uh, sorry, yeah, sorry, in January of uh, 2014, the uh, YPD split, uh, it, it sort of uh, declared their own uh, anonymity from, um, autonomy, sorry, from the Kurds and set about this new state. And you can see sort of some pictures of, of those fighters and that sort of situation. But what is interesting is that how they sort of reformed to this sort of social libertarianism and some of the things that they um, pushed forward or what came out because of it. And this very much aligns with Finis's own political sort of leanings and language. If you look at their manifesto, they very much align with that kind of politics and, and this sort of state themselves really. And then they choose to help this group out with a donation. So clearly, they have a, they have some sort of sympathy or empathy uh, with, with Rojava, and they like what they're doing. Um, and in the most recent disclosures, they also call them, you know, they mention it. And um, yeah, I just think it was interesting to sort of you know explain that a little bit more and put a face to uh, Rojava. Um, so there you go. Um, a little bit more context as well. So Turkey. <laughs> Turkey doesn't get on with the uh, with the Kurds, and, and there's a massive, obviously, massive conflict internally, and there's a lot of a lot of military aggression between Turkey and Syria, as you can see here in this article. And the timeframes for this kind of align with Finis's hacks, or the next hack that Finis does. Um, so the bank, so Cayman uh, Cayman National. So um, we don't know the full amount of money that was stolen. We know it was a few hundred thousand because Phineas had said it was. Um, we don't know the exact number because the bank hasn't reported it as far as I'm aware. <laughs> but it was, a, it was a good chunk of cash, put it that way. So the 10 grand that they gave to the Rojava is probably the tip of the iceberg. Um, but as you can see there, so they were compromised for the same uh, VPN exploit as hacking team. So, um, which we now know is the Sonic Wall, the Sonic Wall appliance. Uh, and this was obviously uh, disclosed very recently as in uh, late, late last year. Uh, in a very sort of political manifesto. Even for Phineas, it was very, very uh, political. Um, and they talk about that and how they did it. So let's talk, like, let's maybe go into how they did it. So for those that don't know, SWIFT is the financial system that banks use to send money across the world. It's a very uh, gross simplification, but it serves the purposes of today, I think. Um, so basically, Phineas... Uh, broke into the bank via this VPN exploit, uh, pivoted around, probably using the same method, uh, you know, TTPs as they did in Hacking Team and other breaches. 
Um, but what I think is kind of fascinating is where the bank's controls, as a again, as a blue team, as I said earlier, they didn't seem to have that that grit of control because Phineas wasn't was also was able to breach the network, move around, pivot, right, and all those things. They're also able to use three accounts, three different user accounts, compromise those accounts, um, and use them to verify their own Swift messages. Which is, if you do a little bit of research on Swift, is not the done thing. Now, granted, this this was before the security re- rework of Swift. After uh, numerous banks around the world had suffered breaches and, and Swift was abused in certain ways, and um, harsher or stricter, sorry, standards were brought in to sort of secure them, right? Like uh, harder baselines or stronger baselines, sorry. Um, but in this case, the bank weren't even checking the outgoing Swift messages. So Phineas was, was able, because of access, they were, they were able to do this, and it was only detected out of error. So the first time Phineas does this, they send the money through Mexico, and it's flagged because they got it, the way it went, because they used the UK fast payment system, it went through the UK. So obviously the red flag is not going to send. And that was when they found, it's not clear how the full chain worked in terms of which transaction went through, you know, we, we don't know. But Phineas discloses that a number of transactions um, did get caught and were cancelled, but it seems like some that they did do worked, obviously, because the money was stolen. So we don't know the exact, you know, um, the exact timeline of events there, but again, I think it's interesting to sort of mention. Okay, cool. Okay, so let's talk about the a- a- AKP. So remember Turkey I mentioned earlier, they're, they're, they're sort of um, uh, political, uh, you know, war with uh, Syria or the, the ideolog- ideological war with Syria. Um, a- AKP is the largest of the, the ruling political party in Turkey. And Phineas broke into their uh, TLD, so their main party domain, uh, and stole a bunch of email, which is very political, right? Um, interesting about this, though, um, is that the uh, this is pick- picked up by WikiLeaks, as it often is, and an intermediary with the Rojava again. So Phineas clearly wanted to clearly wanted to get some information between Tur- the Turkish government and the Rojava, right? Again, because they have some sort of empathy there, um, and spoke to someone within the Rojava to sort of ease this over, or maybe is this information useful to you in some sort of you know information war or something? Um, however, someone from that group then went to WikiLeaks, and WikiLeaks took what they gave them and published it, despite that representative from the Rojava saying, "Please do not publish just sort of what do you think." They published it anyway, and this resolved in Phineas actually being frozen out of the network because they went into full, you know, DFIR mode and shut Phineas out, discovered the breach, and closed it down. So, you know, it's detrimental to Phineas's motives, I suppose, because they wanted to stay there for longer and gather more information. Um, but yeah, so within that data that was stolen, I, I assume among that that data, the, the entire voter database for the political party was also among it. However, at the time, it was falsely reported that Phineas was the only person to have leaked this and, 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 and you know, and the other arguments, you know, uh, nation state and all this stuff. But actually, that's incorrect. Phineas wasn't the first person to leak this database. It's funny, right? I know. Like, <laughs> but another group uh, had done it months before. Uh, I think a Turkish group, hacker group, had done it before. So it wasn't the first time. Okay. Uh, oh, and it was about 30 gig as well. So it was quite a lot of, quite a lot of, quite a lot of data that was, was stolen there. Okay, so they were the hacks. Um, so let's go into the aftermath, or maybe the, the highlighted aftermath of some of the breaches, because it gets even gets even more crazy, really. So uh, let's talk about the police union. So there wasn't much follow for Phineas. However, the police union went a bit crazy and just started arresting people that they thought were, were Phineas. And, and by thought, I mean people that retweeted, you know, the posts on Twitter, they were arrested. Um, and the police put out, you know... Um, certain statements that they'd cut the caught Phineas and, you know, their days were over and, and no, they hadn't actually caught Phineas. They were just eeny, meeny, miny, mowing, uh, random people and hoping that it stuck and that they could, uh, you know, win in some sense in the, in the you know, in, in the public's eye. Um, hacking team is, is an interesting one because uh, it went to court. So it was investigated by the Italian authorities uh, thoroughly Um and an American citizen somehow ended up in in all of this, and he was pulled in by the FBI, and they were questioned him and asked him, you know, what is your involvement with this, and, and you know how. Um, and this guy was completely confused as to why the hell the FBI were interested in him over this. He never even heard of Hacking Team, right? Well, it was because of this website. 
So this this website um, is a Bitcoin scratch card, or was a Bitcoin scratch, uh, scratch card website. So you would buy a scratch card and you would get a random amount of Bitcoins. But this site uh, pulled its Bitcoins from another website called buybitcoins.com, I believe. And Phineas uh, broke into that website. Oops. Phineas broke into uh, the Buy Bitcoins website and stole Bitcoins belonging to that guy, belonging to John. So the FBI have a Bitcoin transaction from John's account. The Bitcoins were then used to buy the server that Phineas used to stage the attacks against hacking teams. They think, oh, we've got him. Easy, boys. Right, it's done. We've got the guy, we've got the Bitcoin transaction. It belongs to this guy. He's an American citizen. We can go arrest him in happy days. But again, they were unaware that Phineas had actually hacked and stole uh, the chap's uh, Bitcoins. So it didn't actually lead back to Phineas. Um, so again, it shows this sort of obsec by Phineas, I suppose, you know, a bit smarter deliberately making a, a gap between them and, you know, and the finances of, of doing their operations. Okay, so let's jump back to um, hacking team then. So former employees um, told the investigators that um, the company was basically more worried about selling spyware than it was of keeping hackers away, basically. Um, and the you know, the, the, they also said as well, uh, there's also a comment from an, a senior member of Hacking Team staff uh, that basically said that the company cared, uh, said that too much security would hinder development, basically. Where have you heard that before, right? So they, they basically weren't investing in security at all. Um, and you can see that the fact, you know, the, the, the lack of controls, um, their lack of separation, right, in the network, um, and their attitude, the, the password complexity, all that stuff, right? You can see where they just did not invest at all. So let's move on to their uh, CEO, still current CEO, I might add, um, who has a crazy theory that at the time, he you now knows it's finished, but at the time he had a burning desire to prosecute all of all ex employees that he classed as infidels and traitors and that the breach of, the, of his company was their plan, you know, manifest. They, they plotted against him and his company and the, this breach uh, was them that did it. But actually, in reality, I think we can all probably agree that he was just salty. He was just angry that his company had been um, compromised and breached and that he was ultimately responsible so remember that sonic wall appliance that I told you about at the start of this of the hacking team segment? Well, he was responsible. He refused to upgrade that sonic wall appliance because he used it personally. And despite countless emails from IT begging him to, you know, not just accept the risk, but actually patch it, he refused. <laughs> so karma, I suppose, right? Um, there's a there's a sad story to this as well, in that one employee was actually was was persecuted by uh, the David, uh, and um, he went for the dragged him for the court system, um, and, and really sort of this guy really had to work to prove his innocence. Um, obviously, he was acquitted as the investigation uh, was was dropped by Italian authorities because there was no evidence. There was nothing linking uh, any. You know, they couldn't find any evidence to back to someone. Phineas had really covered their tracks, um, and the investigate the investigators gave up. They closed the case. So Phineas had got away with it. Okay, so uh, recently as well, um, Joseph Men, uh, author, uh, many different publications, but recently The Cult of Dead Cow. In that book, he, he, there's a chapter around Phineas Fisher in which he speculates that someone in the US government uh, disclosed to him that they believe that Phineas Fisher is a na nation state hacker, um, which was then later disproved or counted by a source to Motherboard that basically said that, no, no, the US government actually believe that they're, they're a hacktivist and not a nation state. It was reported, you know, when this came out, that, oh, this is it, this is the smoking gun, we all thought, right? Phineas is fancy bear. No. Here he is. And I've got a short clip of Phineas's response uh, to the comment. Uh, I don't know if you can hear it through the microphone, but we'll have Here to see. Here is Phineas Fisher's statement in a heavy Russian accent. Some very important context that no one talked about. Can anyone hear that? Was... No, okay, so we'll skip. It's okay. Um, if you if you listen to the Cyber Podcast by Motherboard, there's an episode on Phineas Fisher, and they go through and basically just troll uh, Joseph Men and, and other, the, the publications that pick this up. 
um, by having someone with a thick Russian accent reading out their speech. Um, the bug bounty program um, that Phineas, so very recently with that in November when they talked about the bank, they disclosed the information, it's called how they did it. They also launched a hacker bug bounty program, unlike any other, in which they're offering 100 grand uh, for um, hacks on these companies. So, uh, unsure yet if any, any, anyone's actually taken them up on this, but this is an open offer, allegedly. So if you can prove that you've hacked into any of these companies or people within these industries, or, you know, uh, there's quite a lot there, um, they'll pay you money. So, again, another interesting and very sort of extension of Phineas's persona, a bit of a jest, jester, a bit of a joker, not taking themselves too seriously. Um, and that is it. Thank you very much. Uh, for sitting through that. Um, I hope it was useful. Um, yeah, you can follow me on uh, on Twitter. Thank you.